Hello and welcome. In this episode of My Time with Radha, I speak with Clea about her time with Swami Radha. We discuss her early childhood memories of the ashram and her experience growing up connected to the teachings and lineage. Hi, Clea. Hi, Katie. It's wonderful to be here with you today. And to begin, I had asked Clea what prayer she would like to start with. And I believe this prayer is called the prayer to Saraswati, but I'm not quite sure. Do you have any insight on that? I don't know, actually. It's kind of buried in the Kundalini book, and it also begins the Devi of Speech book, but I don't know if it has a title, but it's one of my favorites. So, O Devi, O Saraswati, reside thou ever in my speech, reside thou ever on my tongue tip, O Divine Mother, giver of faultless poetry. Thank you, Clea. I can say that's the first time we've ever uh, started one of the podcasts with this prayer, and it's definitely a favorite of mine. I remember during the YDC working with this prayer, and it's just so beautiful. Yeah, it's really been, you know, if, if we're talking about Swami Radha today, if there's one thread in my life with her, it's, it's poetry, it's writing, it's art, and it's the power of language. And so I just wanted to, to me, it's like a more of an incantation. It's an ode. It's something I, I like to keep in mind because it is a, a deep connection to me with her particularly. So we'll get started, as we always do, uh, at the beginning. And my first question for you, Clea, is when did you first meet Swami Radha? Uh, how old were you? And how did your relationship with her develop? I met her when I was five, <laughs> in the late 70s, so either end of 78 or 79. So I was very young. So I don't actually remember the first time I met her. I don't know if it's like a clear memory because I was so little. I mean, I have memories of meeting her around the ashram out on walks. I was probably with my mother, probably hiding a little bit, nervous, scared, because Swami Radha was such a kind of this beautiful and yet intimidating figure. And I was like a little little person. So I don't yeah, I don't remember the exact moment, which is interesting. I just always remember her in my life. Like I don't have memories without Swami Radha in my life. So that's like a really interesting gift. My mother, for people who don't know, I was Swami Radhananda. She became Swami Radhananda in the 90s. But in the 70s, she was uh, my mother, Marianne, and she brought me to the ashram. Uh, her friend, Susan, who is Jyoti Ananda, uh, introduced her to the ashram. And then once she found it, I think she did, she just fell in love with that place. And um, she spent like any time she possibly could, she would go to the ashram. We lived in Southern Alberta. So from that like first visit on, I think she came for the first time in 78 and she brought, she brought us later on that year or the year after. Um, but from that moment, we would just be there any chance. So any holiday, Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas, any long weekend, all summer long, she would always try to get there for the summers. It was really our second home um, as a family. And so that, that really continued throughout uh, my young life until I was 16 and I went off to school and she moved to the ashram full time. So in that period, Swami Radha, there's, there's just so much. There's a, like a whole lifetime in that, in that youth period. Um, 
and even the time up until 95 when she passed. So it's an interesting, it's hard to even talk about how my relationship with her developed in a way because it's such a unique time to be in her presence and really be at the ashram. Like they're very interconnected to me. Um, because she was also very much at the ashram in the early in the 70s and early 80s. She was living there much more than she did later on. And she was always around. She wasn't like a she was, you know, at dinner with us in Main House. All of us, there was, you know, all of us at that point, the ashram and the, our, its capacity was much smaller. And we all, the kitchen and the hub of um, activity, food, kitchen, cleaning, eating was all done in Main House with all of us. And she was there with everyone. You know, she was giving sad sayings. She was, she had people over for tea. She was walking the ground. So she was just a really ever present right, figure. And yeah, I was pretty shy kid for sure. And I think as anyone, as I, I know a lot of people describe her as or have, they are a little bit afraid of her or describe her as fierce. And there's that, as a child, like she was very, um, yeah, just mysterious and intriguing and a little scary and also like an authority there, obviously. So it, it was just, we had so much freedom and so much, we were given so much freedom to like roam and run around the ashram. So that was such an amazing part. And then like this wild space. And then there's this very, you know, um, formal uh, woman who it was. This was her, it was also very clear. Like this was her manifestation in a way. So if I think of my young self and moments with her that were impactful or like that I that stood out to me because there are there's so many of this almost daily interactions with her when we when we were there. I'd have to say it was, I mean, there's moments where I got a glimpse into her world. If I think about a moment that stood out to me as a young person meeting her and it was getting the glimpse into her world, uh, the world of the ashram itself was very familiar to me, but she had this other, I mean, she lived in many mansions, which is still there, but it was kind of this mysterious place at that point for me. Anyway, she invited my family, so my mother and my brother and myself over. I think it was Christmas. It was definitely Christmas. I remember being very nervous. I think I would have been six or seven. So I was trying to place it. And she just invited us over for some tea, some treats, probably. She liked to of that and then we came into many mansions and then she said to uh, said to my brother and I that we could she had little gifts in her room and we could go and pick one and so the setup of her room like to get to her room we had to walk through her bedroom and it was and it's like you know, I'm a little person too. This is very, and I, we had to go one at a time and I was super nervous. And her bedroom was like this very elegant uh, place. Like she was a really elegant European woman, right? She's had this very fine tastes in a way, even though she was a renunciate at that point in her life, she had sort of welcomed back physical comforts. And she, you know, had this beautiful bed, the satin, like, bedspread or silk. So it was very fine material. She had this armoire with, like, jewels and perfume and, um, you know, and her furniture is antique Chinese furniture. And she had these beautiful and frightening Tibetan tankas hanging everywhere. 
and you know statues of krishna that were like the size of me so w- walking through this i it was very um like a just like a foreign magical world and then so you pass through her bedroom and you got into the sunroom and that's this beautiful room of windows and at that time it had a glass roof as well and then this was her sort of study meeting area at the desk and there's tons of books and there's more of these you know spiritual things everywhere golden taras and it was just very felt very uh, this is not what i was used to like the ashram other parts of the ashram are very humble my family was very uh, not to well we were not wealthy we we're very basic um and so seeing all these things like and all this i was just like kind of got i was uh, i was amazed and also very nervous and i could i was so nervous i didn't remember where she said to go and get my little gift i didn't know and there were so many places where there were lots of little beautiful things and i and I had to, I had to turn around and go back and ask her where I had to go, <laughs> and that was like so uh, hard for me to do as a little tiny shy person. Um, but she, yeah, she she walked me back into her room and and showed me it was like a little tree and it had ornaments on it, but they weren't ornaments; they were jewels, like not not like not like real gems, but that little crystals and little lovely things so i got to pick one that i wanted and i chose this little crystal bug (laughs) anyway it was just such a to me it was my first um entry into her like intellectual spiritual um mind like she had such a curious open mind that was created all this like beauty and knowledge and i felt like walking into her rooms i had discovered that and i was very it just stayed with me and my sort of fascination with her as a person and uh, i just thought she was kind of almost like exotic i don't know she was just something i had never encountered before and that was that if i think of a moment that impacted me it was that i mean to this day i'm still very fascinated by her life story her experience her mind how she looked at the world how she was able to connect with so many different spiritual sources and and really synthesize them or interpret them and bring them to life in the way that she did yeah thank you for sharing that kind of your first glimpse into almost her personal life like going through her bedroom and seeing all these things that you hadn't seen before even I'm as you were explaining it, I was thinking about it even symbolically, like going into her world in that very physical sense, but then also in a in a more metaphorical way too. And I'm curious as you know your time with her expanded and you spent more time with her and at the ashram and also your relationship between her and your mother developed. Where did that int- like sense of intimidation go? And, and did it change for you? Was there a moment where you feel you kind of, either her or you began to soften? Well, there's a lot there. I mean, I don't think the intimidation ever left because she is a formidable woman. But she's also family. And I think of the family in that it's this lineage piece that she really, she really supported our family. And my mother was so um, dedicated and had such deep love for her that it, 
I don't know. So I felt that. I felt their relate the power of their relationship in my life. Um, and I felt always her support. Like she could be very challenging to me as I became I grew into a young woman. Um, but she also encouraged um, independence, like in a really radical way. She really wanted us to be independent, especially uh, the young women. And so that was, yeah, there was, it was both. She's, uh, and I, and people talk about this, there's that fierceness and then there's the love. And there's the softness and joy and even playfulness. And I got to see all of those sides of her um, in different ways. And, and but it's because it's so, I don't, you know, I may have taken like a course with her when I was a teenager, but it doesn't stand out in my mind. But I wasn't a student of hers versus like so many of the, you know, my mother and her uh, generation. Who were her, her direct students and disciples really worked with her on that level. And she was just more of a presence in my life. You know, like my mother's deep connection. And then, so that was, you know, she'd come to stay at our house when I was a teenager. She was like living in our house when she would come to do workshops at, in Lethbridge. So it was like, so I never, I don't know, and I, or like when I lived in Victoria, that was when uh, my aunt, Julie, who was Swami Lalitananda, was her personal assistant. So I'd go over to visit my auntie Julie, as Swami Radha called her, but it was casual. Like we'd have tea and dinner, and I don't know, it was, she was very supportive. Like, and she would take time out to be with me. She would take, she actually, there was a number of times she would make time out to sit down with me and talk with me about like what I wanted to do with my life and things like that. But I never like studied with her. So I think it's a different, um, yeah, relationship in that way than the, guru, disciple, or student teacher that other people had experiences with. Hmm. Yeah, it's a very unique uh, experience that I think very few people, if only a couple, had with her, in with you and, and others. And I'm so curious, like, because I remember when I first learned that you are the daughter of Swami Radhananda and that Swami Lalitananda is your aunt, I remember thinking, wow, like what incredible, like karmic uh, results, you know, like how amazing is that? And did you ever like think about that when you were younger or now? And because I just, I think it's amazing that that's been the path that you were given. Yeah, it's a really, I mean, I think about it a lot. Um, and I, a big, uh, you know, something that has been on my mind a lot in my life. You know, everyone who comes to the ashram has chosen to come. And they can choose to, oh, I like this place, or no, it's not for me. Or I want to go keep coming back, or there's an agency there. And then I have not been given that. Um, so I have never made the choice to be, to be part of the ashram, and yet here I am. Um, and sometimes that's amazing, like what a great gift. And sometimes like, oh, wow, this is my life. This is what I've been given. And, um, you know, is that, is that what I actually want? And that's like a real, especially when I was younger, I had to really tease, tease that out for myself and understand. It's a question, and I think it will always be a question for me, like how much do I be, am I involved? What parts of this place do I value and what parts 
are not authentic to who I am. Uh, there was one time I, uh, we were sitting with Swami Radha. It was in Victoria, I remember. And I was with my mother. And Swami Radha, and I was, must have been a teenager, like maybe 15 or 16. And she, Swami Radha asked me if I would still want to go to the ashram if my mother was no longer there. And I was, and I kind of was shocked and sort of said, well, yes, yes. And I don't know if I even knew at that time what the answer was, but I couldn't, I wasn't about to say no, or I don't know. I guess so I just said, yes, of course. And so it's been an interesting, you know, that was young. My mother is no longer there. She passed away in 2021, but I find myself still going back to the ashram. So, yeah, it's a really, it's such a, it's such an interesting relationship there because there is this lineage. They do say if you take vows of sannyas, you bless seven generations behind you and seven generations in front of you. So I do feel very carried by my mother's commitment and protected and supported in my life. And there's a, there's a deep, there's like a, there's a mystical aspect to it too. Like, how did I arrive here um, through no work of my own in this lifetime, right? So that opens it up to more questions that maybe are harder to answer because they're not of this earthly realm. I do have had very strong feelings of that, um, of uh, almost more like sisterhood with my aunt and my mother and Swami Radha. That has, or she, Swami Radha would often say, we've been together before. So I don't know what that means, but I know I have a deep, deep connection to to the ashram, to Swami Radha, especially like when I was starting to work, to work for the ashram, doing Ascent Magazine, and then I worked with Timeless Books. Uh, so almost 15 years, so that, that period of time, that was when I felt the most connected. So it was after Swami Radha had died, and yet here I was working with her work. And that was, I think, the most meaningful work I've, I've done in my life. I really appreciated you talking about your, yourself being carried by your mother's promise. Because, of course, it's so connected to the title of her book, Carried by a Promise. And as you were explaining, you know, your memories from Main House and having dinner with Swami Radha and how involved she was like I just kept getting flashbacks from scenes of the book and and her writings and I also wanted to say like you said something along the lines of you know to no work of your own you are here but but also like thinking about all that you have done for the ashram and how you're continuing to be present and showing up I would say that it, it is through your own work that you've you know, kept that connection and that relationship. And I think that's really just magical because it could have been, you know, all this karmic grace and you reject it and maybe in the next life, but it sounds like you've kind of accepted it. And I would love to hear a little bit more about your involvement with the ashram and how it's changed and developed over time. You mentioned Timeless Books and of course, Ascent Magazine. What was that time like for you? Oh, wow. It was a really uh, fertile time, I think. <laughs> so it was after Swami Radha died. I was 25 when I moved to the ashram to start my work on Ascent. I was there for a year, just under a year and a half, and then we moved it to Montreal. So I was very young, and the ashram really 
opened a door for me. Uh, so I was, uh, I just had always written. I loved writing. I wanted to be involved in, uh, you know, writing, writing books, writing in magazines, doing, that's just what I wanted. And that opportunity came up. Uh, it was a very, very generous opportunity. And they were very trusting of my vision. And so that was pretty incredible to work on that. You know, in, in 1999, I think the yoga industrial complex, as we know it today, how it works was just starting. And my experience at the ashram is so counter to how yoga is mostly present in, in, our, in our North American society today. Uh, so I really wanted, and I could see it was starting to really bubble up, like it was getting, uh, all right, it was focusing around these beautiful superstar teachers and all this stuff was, it, it was really around the physical perfection and almost athleticism or, you know, so that was, that was just rising and that's what people knew yoga was and we didn't have a million yoga studios everywhere people it wasn't a normalized thing and so we were just quietly kind of putting out um because ascent had always existed at the ashram it's been around since the 60s as long as the ashram in some form and it was always like a community newspaper so what i what i wanted to do was bring that sort of sense of integrity and spiritual depth that the ashram offers, put that out in the world. But also a big thing for me was finding others who were doing a similar thing and not necessarily in yoga, but I wanted to find where the yoga was living where we might not see it, where people aren't just in, you know, stretching on their yoga mats. And, you know, where is it living in an artist's world or their work? Where is it living in, in activism? How do we see spiritual grace when, when we die? I think and it was because the ashram work is so integral to me. It was never ashram versus or yoga versus not yoga or ashram or outside world. It's like, I want to, I know there's other people like this and I want to bring us all into conversation. And that was, and I, I wanted to do that and because that is how Swami Radha worked. She was not in a bubble of her, herself or even um, her own guru, Shivananda. It wasn't a direct, she wasn't teaching Shivananda yoga. She was this roving, curious intellect who was pulling on everything. She, was, she read everything. She was interested in science. She was interested in, you know, arts of all kinds. She was interested in medicine. She was interested in all this, you know, Buddhism, Tibet, like so, so much of the ashram work is really actually rooted in Tibetan Buddhism and Kashmiri Shaivism. And there's all these things she's pulling from and interpreting. And so I, that to me as a young person made such an impression. And that to me is the ashram, like how she synthesized what the ashram is. And I, I just, I wanted to extend that. I didn't want to, I don't, like there's a bubble that the ashram is and you can feel it when you're there and there's this wonderful little bubble, but the world is also at work. And we, and I, I want to connect with that, the, you know, those, similar forces, I guess. Anyway, so that was Ascent. And it's, I think it was still like such an incredible project and we could give jobs to other young people who are interested. Um, a lot of the youth from the ashram kind of graduated up into working for Ascent. And it's like a really, really fertile uh, 10 years. That it, Man. So that was Ascent Magazine. I was there for six of those years full time. And then after that point, I needed a little break. And then I started working for Timeless. And 
my project over the next 10 years was really uh, we did all the reissues of the books so we needed to do reprints so we redesigned and reissued all of Swami Rada's books we were able to publish books by some of the Ascent authors a couple of books from Swami Radhananda and Swami Lalitananda so being able to work with these sacred texts on a daily basis, re like rereading, like proofing, editing, reading these books through multiple times, is a it just felt like those things got even deeper into my my cells. So that was a just such a I think and and it was so important to Swami Radha, Timeless Books. Very, very important to her to have her books published and I think so like her books have brought so many people to the ashram and then they're like really the our educational texts it's what people use to study and learn it's all her work there in print so I feel yeah that is, they're just so important to me I have a very deep deep love soft spot in my in my heart for those books and I keep hoping that we'll publish a few more books from those swamis before before that generation leaves us. Mm. And part of that, with working with timeless books, um, and I'm just trying to get oriented just in terms of time, did that also include your work with When You First Called Me Radha, the poetry book? Yeah, we decided to publish her poems, and we the book came with a CD, because she she um, did record her poems, her reading her own poems before she died, and then there it's just like such an incredible recording to listen to her, uh, and uh, I was felt so that was just one of my favorite projects to sort of decipher. She, the poetry is really where her like. You know, she she can be a teacher, sort of inscrutable teacher, but the poetry is this just really tender way into her. It's where her fears are, her love, like she was so in love with the divine, and that's like, you know, that carried her. And those it's very apparent in the poems, but her also her sadness of um being separated or the the difficulty this her path was not an easy one so that's all there in the poems it's a it's an underrated book that i yeah it's very beautiful it's one of my favorites for sure well now clea i think it's a good time to move into our theme of the day and i had chosen the theme of growth and I have here a passage from Swami Radha from uh, Light and Vibrations. So I thought it would be nice to bring her into our conversation. She writes, It is through the light of understanding and the light of love that we will grow until eventually we are lifted to a new level of being. When we experience divine union, when the drop of individual consciousness returns to the ocean of cosmic consciousness, we are released from the maya of our limited understanding. And bringing that in and having this, you know, thought and thinking about growth and the light, um, what does growth mean to you? And how has it been a part of your relationship with Swami Radha? the teachings, the ashram, and the lineage. Yeah, growth is such an interesting thing because you can't, it's really hard to measure growth in the moment. Can't see, or you look at a plant, you can't see it growing. Um, and I think that's the same for a person, for myself anyway. Um, so it's in retrospect, that you can see growth. I think there's a yeah. So there's a I, I, when I and then I, when I think of growth. I'm a big gardener. I love growing things, and so 
I think of the ground. And it's, so it's because it's very hard to will growth or to plan growth. But what, what I can do is cultivate the ground. So I am thinking of that. I, I always think of the ashram as sacred ground. And, and the, so yeah, so the question is how to cultivate that ground or how to root in that ground or because there's a rootedness that you have to start with to grow. Yeah, so I just, when I'm thinking of how that relationship with the ashram is so interesting and that way I think of all these because there's phases in my growth there's a my, myself as a child when um, you know the ashram was my playground that was what it was we it was this magic playground and I think about myself as a young woman it was like a training ground. It's really where I learned how to work. And I really learned how to work hard. And I learned what karma yoga was and that understanding selfless service and the fruits of our labor in that way. Um, that was such a, that is such a powerful um, thing that I carry with me really is that training ground piece, that understanding selfless service. Um, and then there was like the whole, the publishing era, the sense and timeless era where I wasn't actually at the ashram very much. I wasn't living there. And yet I felt so grounded in that work. And it was such that fertile creative, creative time for me. Um, and then, you know, a few years ago, we, I moved uh, back to, Nel and to Nelson to be closer to the ashram to take care of my mom. And I became her caretaker. And I got to be with her when she died at the ashram in the sunroom where Swami Radha used to live. And so it felt like this really sacred burial ground it's all these, it really feels like, so, um, so if I look back at that, there's this growth from this child brought to the ashram by her mother to who I am now, putting her mother into the ground or into the lake as, as we did, not the actual ground, the water, but like that's an incredible growth. If I like look at that life and I'm only halfway through or midlife-ish, you know, so it's, I could never have planned that arc of my life or that growth. And I, I, there's the other, like you talked about, you know, the light of love and understanding, and it, it's that line from divine light invocation to, like, I'm ever growing into divine light, because that's what we do, right? This is like the actual physics of this realm. We're on the earth, we're rooted on the ground, and yet we are reaching up to the light. The plants are growing to the light. We are growing to the light. And it, it's, you know, every time I'm at the ashram, I feel my younger self there. And I have, like, I still feel like the ashram kid, you know? And, and I'm not a child anymore. But um, yeah, that's it's a it's a just an acceptance. The growth feels like an acceptance. It's a and it's cultivating the ground. It's tending the ground. It's letting myself grow up in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of image of the playground turned into the training ground, turned into the work ground, the service. And I wonder, you know. When I think of growing and growth, I've been thinking about it in terms of like when children first start to have teeth, have baby teeth, and the growing pains that come with that. And I wonder how has 
grow that idea of growing pains or even challenges. How has that been part of your growth um, and connection with Swami Radha? Was there, you know, a time where there was resistance in you and the growing pains were just too much? Mm -hmm. I'm a pretty resistant person. <laughs> pretty stubborn. Um, but you can turn that into a good thing sometimes. Um, Oh, I, there's a couple of things there. Like for me, there's a, there is a. Yeah. I mean, I do have to. I think, and I talked. I spoke of this earlier. Like, there's a, something I have to be authentic to myself within the ashram. Like I'm of the ashram, but I'm not like of the ashram. I don't. It's hard to explain. So I, there, uh, there's always this friction for me, like how much am I part of this community and how much do I, uh, what do I choose to do here? Like how can I make choices? I haven't made the big choice, but I'm here. And how, what are the little choices I can make to make myself be, feel like authentic? So there's a, always a little bit of friction between that being my home and the place I just, my home ground, my sacred ground, and that being, um, you know, it's actually everyone else's spiritual home too. That's the miracle of the ashram. It it opens to everyone, and I can call it my home, but it's every person who loves and comes to the ashram will also call it their spiritual home. And I think that that it has that generous heart is really incredible. But yeah, it's it, for me. It's a, like it's a home versus the community, not versus, but like how do I? Sometimes I feel they circle each other, and sometimes they come together. So in little ways, I have to carve out my independence within that community. So in that way, it's just yeah, finding my own path in within the ashram. I think that's what it is for me. So I don't know if that's growing pains. It's uh, it's just about making choices. Is something I I did a practice. One of my favorite lines ever, Swami Radha's, is the last illusion is Shakti herself. And I took that as a practice at one point in my life when I stopped working at Ascent because I wanted to undo my conditioning in a way, like these little tiny things. Because Swami Radha would say, okay, when you hear an ambulance siren, say Om Namah Shivaya, you know, like, say, or, like, do the light here, say this mantra, that is like, so all those things were very automatic, and I felt like they weren't my choice again, if we go back to that idea of what, what have I chosen, and the, to me, the last illusion of Shakti herself is, you know, we, is this spiritual life, and we're, we're, moving towards the divine but is that is she also part of the maya is shakti an illusion is, is she an illusion so i did a i held that line for quite a long time in trying to figure out my own way yeah it, i think it's just about that i you know i know some people show up at the ashram and they're like all in everything it's like their favorite thing and I, I, I've been there, I've done it all in many different stages of my life. And so, yeah, I'm just always questioning what is it that I connect to the most. So I don't think it's growing pains, but it's a re reevaluating consistently. Yeah, to find your own choosing and your, where does your choice come in and... And then how, to, how does that facilitate growth and bring you closer to yourself? And with all of that, I'm curious if there's, you know, you already shared such a beautiful memory of you and Swami Radha during Christmas time and the gifts. I wonder if there's another moment that you've shared with her throughout your life um, that you hold close to your heart and would like to share with us. It's really hard to choose a moment, I have to say, that because there are so many and because I was so young, it's, it's, I feel like I, I got to know her better when I worked on her books. 
And so as a as a like I got to know her more deeply. Mm -hmm. There's been pujas that are lovely. There was the mantra pronouncement that was powerful. And she talked with she took time out after that to talk with my brother and I about, you know, being young and in the world and what we you know. There's been like all these things and it feels very cumulative. It doesn't feel like there's these moments. Mm -hmm. And when you think about your life today and where you are, how do you connect with Swami Radha? How do you feel close to her? And how does she show up in your world? Um, I talk to her. <laughs> I talk to her. I talk to my mother. They're like my ancestors, my people. She just feels present. You can't be at the ashram and not think of her. I think of her when I'm writing, when I'm reading. You know, there's that just being, trying to continue that practice of being intellectually curious. That is very, very much a gift from her and, and something I, I carry with me. Hmm. Well, Clea, it's been so incredible to hear all these stories and experiences that you've had, both with the ashram, with Swami Radha, and, and with your own growth and your own life. Um, so I'm really grateful for, for you for sitting down with me and having these conversations and for sharing so many beautiful glimpses of Swami Radha. Yeah, you're welcome. And Nice to talk with you, Katie. Thanks for doing all this. I'm appreciating uh, the gathering of stories from, from everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Clea. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode. Yashodra Ashram is located on the unceded traditional territory of the Tanaha and Sanaixt peoples. You can learn more about the ashram by visiting our website at yashodra.org. You can also follow us on Instagram and YouTube. Until next time, I'm Katie Taher, and this is My Time with Radha.